and uh, this is this is going to be super interesting because, of course, we have a learning pirate with us today, uh, <laughs> which is not something you get to say very often. <laughs> um, and even more unusually, perhaps the learning pirate is here to talk to us about <laughs> brains and science, which is not necessarily the first thing that leaps to mind when you think of pirates, but. Um, this is going to be awesome. So I will get out of the way. Um, I'll be back throughout this one. Um, I'll hand over control to you now, Lauren. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Oh, it's so good to be with everyone. Um, so I'm just going to let you you all know, just so you can understand that I, I typically am able to see you or the chats. Um, so I'm going to be using Tom's Tom's sultry voice to help me out uh, with the chat interaction because I'm not here just to talk at you. I'm here to have a conversation with you and, and obviously to play with your brains. That's what I do. So uh, let's let's get going. For those of you who who don't know me, hi, I'm Lauren. Uh, I am the founder of Learning Pirate, um, one of the only scientific learning designers in the world thus far, trying to change that as quickly as I possibly can. Um, those of you who do know me might know that this uh, this word up on your screen right now, it's pretty much how I say everything <laughs> that I need to say in life. Um, but what it does stand for, it's an ideology behind uh, what I believe learning can be about, which is this, it's the moment when you, when you know, you know, you are really ready. and when my brain kind of came knocking at my head, if you will, after, you know, close to 14 years in learning and development. And uh, it said, hey, hey, I'm the brain and I do all the learning and, uh, you know, all that designing you've been doing and all that facilitating. Well, maybe you should th you know, think about me just a little bit. So about six years ago, my my whole world changed when when I started getting into neuroscience and I got my credentials and um you know, it really did start off as a professional journey. I always said, I know I can design learning a little bit more effectively, um, but the more I learned about my operational system itself, it just, it just changes you. It changes you as a fundamental human being. So um, that being said, it is it's, it's so exciting to to be able to take you know six years of intensive study with uh, with a lot of nerds that I have on my team who keep me honest uh, with the science itself to to bring you some of this amazing stuff and what we can do with learning with our brains and of course any of you who are dare to design learning this stuff is going to be pretty cool um, if we're going to be friends which I really hope we are um, a few things about me so. Uh, number one, never ask me to fix anything in your house. Um, I'm terrible at doing anything. If you want it MacGyvered, really good at that. Um, I only eat red apples. And when I'm designing learning, for those of you who are old school into the electronic scene, when I design learning, I'm actually listening to a genre of music called liquid drum and bass. So <laughs> if you want to hear what that sounds like, uh, I'll drop a link later in the chat. Um, so Tom, I'm going to ask you to, uh, to let me know what people's responses are in the chat to this question, but who's, um, who's ever been in an MRI machine before or who, who, like if, if you even just know what an MRI is, who's ever been in one of those before? Just a yes or yep, me, Tom, just, I'll get you to tell we're me We're just waiting on. on some responses from that now, but we've, uh, it looks like we've got a couple of, uh, music fans in though. Um, yeah. so you're not alone with those preferences, <laughs> um, what have we got coming through? So uh, have you been in an MRI before? Uh, we've got no, but it sounds fun. Uh, <laughs> a couple of yeses, a couple of noes. More <gasps> yeses than I might expect, to be honest. Okay. That's no, this really is interesting. Great. No, this is amazing. So part of my due diligence as a science translator and someone who represents scientists themselves is to sort of pay homage, if you will, to how lucky we are to be where we are in technology and science. So um, I myself, was all, I've also been into MRIs. Um, I, I participate lots now in studies because it's cool to see what's going on in there. But I want to show you where this all started. This is a man, the guy with the mustache, his name is Dr. Damadian, and the guy sitting beside him is his grad student. Now, this is the first ever MRI that was built and that was actually tested. This is how it all started. Now, for those of you who are, uh, I won't say older, we're all young at heart, but I mean, look at this thing. He's wearing what looks like an air conditioning unit <laughs> around his chest. Um, and this is how science started when it came to being able to look into the brain. So they obviously convinced this guy to get into the machine and he doesn't look as confident anymore. But just so you see, the MRIs that we know now and the way that we're able to look into the brain is, is so much more significant now that we've got great technology. So Thank you, science. Um, if I showed you some of the horrifying pictures of like things from the 1800s, 1950s, like even from the 1950s, um, let's just be really grateful that no one's drilling into our heads anymore to figure out what's going on in there. So 
homage to science done. Now, Tom, I'm gonna need your, your eyes on the chat for me because my next question for everybody is, I wanna know a little bit about you. So tell me something, what are you amazing at? Like, what are you like just absolutely amazing at? And that could be something from work or it could be something like, you know, you can make really great grilled cheese sandwiches. Um, if that's the case, I, I like grilled cheese, give me a shout. But what are you amazing at? And Tom, if you could just sort of read out as they're, they're coming in, just tell me what people are amazing at. Sure thing, let's have a look. Let's see what people are saying. We're just waiting for the stream to catch up. Yeah. Uh, here we go. We've got uh, Danielle can run pretty well. Oh, I know um, Danielle can run really well. Hi, Danielle. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Morgan, procrastinating, core skill. Oh. Love it. We're part of the same team there. Uh, Mike, drumming. Um, oh, nice, Mike. Jonathan's great at taking tests. Um, oh. We've got people amazing at learning. Um, yes. Be Benjamin is just pretty amazing. Okay, that's cool. Okay, uh, Benjamin. <laughs> we've, I, got, I uh, we've got Paella writing poetry, oh, uh, Paella, writing short beautiful. stories. Awesome. Oh, gosh, this is amazing. Oh, I love all your amazings. This is fantastic. Okay, follow up question to all of this. As you're watching everybody's amazing come in, um, are you are you feeling good about that? Does it make you does it bring a little smile to your face? You can give like a thumbs up or a yes in the chat and Tom will reiterate that to me. Is anyone really upset after seeing what everybody else is really amazing at? <laughs> just wait. I just, um, okay, we're, yeah. we're just waiting. We're yeah. good. Yes. We're all yeah. good. Everyone's really happy. <laughs> Everyone rocks. I think people like to see that. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. So. Lesson number one for all my learning designers out there, nothing like a little emotional reactivity to get your learning session started off. Get that dopamine and serotonin, which helps us solidify beautiful memories when we wanna create them. We'll get into a little bit about emotion and cognition afterwards. But the other thing that just happened there was that you had to stop and you had to think for just even 30 seconds or maybe maybe those of you who are just like, no, nope, I'm just amazing, I'm good, I know it. Um, but what you just did there was a metacognitive moment. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with metacognition is, metacognition is a theory that goes well back to the 1970s. And what we're looking at, when we're looking, and it's, it's massive and we can use it for so, so many different things. But really when we're looking at metacognition, we're thinking about thinking. So it's the process of developing a cognitive self-awareness and then it's our ability to assess that. If I could teach the world, if I had that magic wand that people always talk about and could teach and put that skill and ability into everybody's brains, this would be it. It is absolutely amazing. The reason being is that it allows us to become this, the performance, sorry, we become the audience to our own performance. And it's amazing for us as just individuals, but when we are talking about learning and learning design, it becomes even more valuable. It's an equally valuable skill because when we're able to design in using various theories of metacognition, what we're able to do is this. We can assess what do you know, what don't you know, and what's really important here is what you think you know. And this is the beauty, and this is why I like just um, adore <laughs> what I do, is we're able to basically get into the learning design itself to assess people in the moments so that they don't get to the end of a learning intervention or a course or a series and then realize, I didn't actually know, <laughs> I thought I knew, but I don't. And when we get to that point, it means that we can't transfer it into something else. So being able to continually monitor, to be continue, continually be aware of what you know and what you don't know, and to do that as you're going through saves us a lot of time. Now, for my learning designers out there where, where this becomes very beneficial and how I use this is I'm using it as a two-prong approach. So first, I'm using it embedded into the learning design itself so that the learner is empowered to catch themselves in these like, oh, I thought I knew that, but I didn't know that. And we can actually, they're little traps, if you will, but it's its a feedback mechanism that we can use, like I said, so they don't get to the end of something and realize that they actually didn't know. On the measurement side of it, it's equally as beneficial because then us as the designers, we can now see, well, if we've strategically placed these in, 
the effectiveness and the efficacy of our designs so that when we go to go to the next iteration, we know how to make it that little bit better. I could teach a whole course on this. <laughs> In itself, I could teach an absolute whole course on this, but this is a little bit um, of a tidbit that I can give you for now. As a human being, the skill of metacognition is, wow, the, the essence to metacognition is your ability to catch your thought processes and not just your thought processes, but it can also be your feelings in the moment that they're happening. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that in, in a bit, but just keep that in mind. Everything that we're talking about today, it's not just about learning. It's, it's not just about how we can design and facilitate. These are just fundamental human things that no one ever taught us, but gosh, we can learn them now and it's really exciting. And just like that, you're seeing how big of a nerd I am. <laughs> so just be incredibly clear. Um, here's what we're going to learn or what you're going to learn during our time together. And I guess we've got about what, half an hour left. Nothing. You're going to learn absolutely nothing. So just sit back, relax, enjoy the ride. But I'm going to try to take you through as much as I can and try not to like overkill your brains while I'm doing it. Now, I'm about to blow your minds a little bit. Um, Tom, I'm going to need your, your help with this one um, as I'm interacting with everybody. So if you want to understand learning and not just learning, we can't just say learning and not memory. But if you want to understand learning and memory, um, as well as like behavior change, then we basically have to understand a little bit about who we are and why we are. And the best way to do that is to get into our brains a little bit. So I'm gonna, with you, build a brain, piece by piece. You can follow along, you can do this at, um, if you're just sitting and watching, but what you're looking at is essentially the three pieces that build one cell in your brain, right? So if you look at the palm of your hand and you just picture that, that transmitter in the middle, that's one cell, one neuron. I'm sure you've heard the word neuron before. That would be that circle. Now, you start off with about 100 billion of those when you're, when you're born and they reduce because connections form and we don't need that many anymore. But then what happens is these tree branch like structures grow out of this circle, right? And these receive your information. And then your arm would act as like a transmitter a highway, right? So it sends down. Now what happens is these tree branches, they get like these electrical signals. If the signal is strong enough, it'll go through the circle, down your arm, and then shoot out some other little pieces that comes a uh, chemical transmission. When you put these three little pieces together, and by the way, these are my poorly drawn drawings, <laughs> this is what you get. You get one neuron. One of these in your brain can have up to a thousand of these tree branches, and it's depending on what kind of um, neuron it is. So you can have a thousand of these tree branches, but you only have one of these highways that goes down. Now I'm going to show you what a real one looks like in an actual brain. Don't worry, it's not bloody and gucky and <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. But this is actual, this is a real neuron. Now, this neuron is one that is part of uh, your retinal system. So this is part of your visual system. And this is just one. So as you can see, loads of those branches coming out. Now what I'm going to show you, and Tom, you're going to have to let me know if my animations are, are actually working. I'm going to show you what one of these looks like when it's growing. Um, and maybe you've seen this before. Maybe this is the first time you've seen it. I can't stop watching this. Tom, is everything moving there on the screen there? Yep, that's working perfectly. Amazing. So what you're watching right now is one of these tree branches. This is a neuron growing. And these tree branches are growing because you're learning and you're experiencing. Those of you who I've never met before, you have started to grow some of these that represent my face, my voice. It's happening as we speak. I'm gonna do one thing really quickly. I'm just gonna go back one more time. I'm gonna play it again. And what I'd like you to pay attention to this time is at the bottom, um, on, my, on my side of the screen, it is on the bottom right. Excuse me. See where it says Wednesday, four o'clock? And we're watching the time go up. Now, the other neuron that you see is not growing those tree branches because it's in a regular cell. But in a regular brain, what would happen is these would start making connections. Now, we started at Wednesday at around 4 o'clock. This video keeps going on for a long time, but it ended around Friday, like, afternoon. And it still hasn't made any connections. Learning takes time. This is why learning takes time. And learning's not easy. Learning's hard because we got to grow those things. Now, first of all, Tom, in the chat, can I ask people, did that blow your mind at all? Like, when I see these things, it blows my mind every time. How's everyone doing? Let's see how people feel. There is just a, a few seconds delay between uh, between live and the chat, so we'll just wait no for it to come in. Move ahead while that shows. 
Is your mind blown yet? If not, I'm gonna I'm gonna try harder. <laughs> I know the speed of it was for me. I kind of think of it. I kind of think of it being incredibly slow growth, and that kind of you think oh, that's a couple of days, but I, I I would expect it to be much slower than that. Um, that I was amazed. Well, remember that's well. First of all, it's sped up, and uh, yeah. second of all, like it hadn't connected to anything, so there's no memory created yet. Yes, it still yeah. had to keep going. How's everyone doing yeah. there? Yeah, we've certainly got we've got some shocked faces. Great stuff. All right, let's keep going. Wait, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep going with you guys. Wait till you see what it looks like when there's thousands of those happening. But let's put the full story for you together. Those little red and yellow dots that you see, those are what's making actual communication in your brain. Those are called synapses, and they send the chemical transmissions. So literally, <laughs> everything. Your ability to change, and the centralization of learning and all behavioral modification happens at these things. Now, this is really kind of hard to conceptualize. So when I looked at this the first time, like, okay, what would this actually look like? Like if I actually, you know, thought about this a little bit, and this is what I came up with. If you stuck your hand in a bunch of like cake frosting and then put a bunch of sprinkles around it, <laughs> that's what it would look like. Millions of these little synapses and these things change so that we can learn as well. So logical question, what's learning? Check this out, okay? Learning a subject or a skill involves you growing very topic-specific tree branches, and then they connect to other ones of the neurons. This is what this looks like. Now, time marker on this, this is like ton, this is about six or seven different neurons that you're looking at, but this is happening constantly in your brain. Now you can see the time marker there on the bottom of the screen too, and how many connections are sort of weaving around in there. So I'm going to let you just absorb that for a second. I could stare at this all day, every day, because the fact that it's happening in our brains as I'm speaking, as you're watching it, just fascinates me to no end. Tom, what are people thinking? Does anyone else think this is super cool or should I just like give up? <laughs> uh, oh, no, I think we've got some real people interested here. So um, I know Phil's super interested. This is the sort of thing that got him into L&D in the first place. Yeah, Phil. Um, We've got we've got uh, we've got hashtag learning nerd going on. Um, is there anything on the planet as complex and wonderful as the human brain? From from Jonathan Rock, there. I think we could agree hilarious. more there. Yeah, no. Um, as far as I'm concerned, no, there's not. There's really not anything more complex on this planet except for these things. So we're now that we've got like an. This is why we really have to advocate for the process of of learning being a human thing, a fundamental human thing. Now, we don't have, I don't have all the time in the world to, like, as we know, complex thing, can't teach you all the things about it. So what I will say is we've got two really cool parts of your brain that I'm going to show you, and this is going to help you to understand a couple of things. What's rotating around on your screen right now is your prefrontal cortex. Right behind your forehead right there is where your executive function lives. So, you know, all the really important things like problem solving, thinking, your behaviors, um, logic, reason, you know, executive function. I call it my boss box. I'm like, that's the boss. Now, what interacts with the cognitive function is this. Now, I'm not showing the part of the brain, but what you're looking here is a simulation of what you might have heard in amygdala hijack. The reason why I want to show you this is the latest research when it comes to emotions and cognition is that the emotional processing centers in your brain can act four to 10 times faster than your executive function. So now think about that when you are designing learning, when you are just having a regular old conversation, I don't know, two years of a pandemic and what that's been doing to all of us. So again, just remember that four to 10 times faster is how fast the emotional processing center of your brain can move than your executive function. So is it good to use emotions when we're learning, when we're designing learning? Absolutely. Emotions are part of every cognitive function that we have, nearly every part of every cognitive function. Sorry, guys, the people walking by me here. So just keep that in mind for your own personal benefit, um, because there are ways that we can actually down-regulate the emotional function so that we can tap into our cognitive function or executive function a bit better. Now, Tom, I'm going to need your help on this one. Um, it wouldn't be a learning pirate session if I didn't mess with you a little bit, so let's do that. Um, now, we don't have the luxury of for you to be able to unmute. Um, and if I could see you on my screens, which I can't, and I don't think Tom can either, but what I would ask you to do is not cheat, so your hands would be up. Now, 
once uh, once I tell you what to do, then when you finish trying to do it, just go ahead and add in the chat like if you could do it or not. And I'm only going to give you about 30 seconds to, to give this a go. So what I'd like you to try to do is, can you please list the months of the year in alphabetical order? And you can try to do that now. If you're, if you're successful, give a big thumbs up in the thing. By the way, you can't write it down. Keep your hands up. You can't Google either. List the months of the year in alphabetical order. And if you're having a really good laugh with yourself right now, just put haha in the chat. <laughs> and Tom will let me know. <laughs> well, after a short try, I can confirm I can't do it. Uh, so <laughs> I may as well wait to see if anyone else can. I can also maybe I'll just save everybody the, the you know it's 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 basically not easy it's really not an easy task it's almost an impossible task okay this is incredibly important for us to know too what does this have to do with it has to do with memory my friends and representations why is it so hard for your brain to do this now if you are um if you're joining us from a country that you that english wasn't your first language maybe this is a this is an easier task depending on the way that you you learned this but because we have a mental representation of it based on the way we learned it, which is chronological, excuse me, chronologically for most of us, it was encoded in our memories this way. So mental representations that are this strong tend to prevent us from wanting to modify it. It's not a flexible mental representation. Now, knowing this as a learning and development professional gets us one step closer to being able to help people to modify or to create a new memory. So Think about what we're dealing with like organizational learning, right? It can be very useful to keep this in mind because sometimes we're asked to design learning or to bring something together for people, but it's very similar to something that they've already got in their memory bank. So obviously what's gonna happen is that the brain loves its own sort of comfort zone. It's always gonna go back to the original thought memory um, or the behavior. So if we know that we're gonna be sort of up against a very strong mental model, we can then design a little bit more effectively, of course, using science, to get around some of these mental models and to help people to create a new memory for the new learning, the behavior, the ability, the knowledge. Pretty cool stuff, um, if you ask me. When we do this, what we're doing is we're then changing those gorgeous neural pathways, we're creating a new network, and we're activating a different part of the brain. So on your screen right now, now this is a child's brain. That's why it might look a little bit smaller to you. This is a child's brain. Um, now, what you'll see is that before, and this was, uh, this is the brain of a kindergarten. So any of you have, who have children there who are trying to uh, learn to read right now, what you actually see on your screen is this is a child before they were trying to learn um, the letter speech correspondence, which is really when we're learning about the alphabet and we're trying to learn the correspondence of the speech. It's when we're like, ah, ah, ah. Apple, right? We start to get the sounds. So before you see there's no activation in that part of the brain. After, when the networks have started con to connect and continue, we can see, and what you're looking at is a functional fMRI. So what that shows is it lights up a different color depending on how much blood flow is going to that part of the brain. And that's how we can see what's active and what's not. So after you can see it's lit up, it's got the connection. And this, my friends, as learning and development professionals, is what we're trying to help people do. We're trying to create those new connections. And the way that we can do that more effectively is through understanding memory a little bit better. Now, memory is a beast. <laughs> it is a beast, beast, beast of a topic. But I'm going to give you a very, very high-level overview of what's going on when it comes to memory and how we can design a little bit more effectively with it and for it. So everything that's going on around you is happening just like inundation of sensory information. Most of it gets tossed out the window. You don't need to remember like those three people who just walked by me or what, or, you know, I'm in Stockholm right now. They're speaking Swedish. Like I don't need to remember all of this. So most of it goes out the window. The sweet spot when it comes to learning is here. It's in the working memory. Key things that we need to remember about working memory. Number one, incredibly limited. So this is why I call it the sweet spot. If we put too much in, we exhaust the cognitive load, which means I'm sure some of you have heard about chunking and sort of like, you know, putting things in. We love our terms in L&D, don't we? Micro learning, macro learning, nano learning, like just, just I don't even know, like Skittle learning, I don't call it whatever you want. But the working memory being so limited, what we want to do is we want to protect that cognitive load. If you remember anything at all from what I'm about to say, remember this, the brain 
is expensive and the currency is energy. So our job as learning professionals and as learning designers is to protect that energy and to use it as efficiently as we possibly can. So working memory is your sweet spot. If we don't rehearse, as we know, if we don't practice, it just goes away. Because what happens is, as those networks, those tree branches, what ha there's, a, there's a coding that comes around them and it makes it go faster. So we're not solidifying the memory, which means it just, those tree branches, as much as you saw them grow, um, I've got footage of them disappearing as well. They can actually erase themselves. Then, okay, we get to the rehearsal. The whole point is to get to encoding. We want to get it into long-term memory. So the three-step process for us to really keep into mind is this. Number one, encode. This is the initial learning of the information. It's very, this is a critical part. In this part, it's basically when we're using a little bit more energy, right? Lots of the resources in the brain are going to be working hard to start to form those new neural networks. If we are talking about unlearning, it's a whole other story because we are then competing against networks that already exist. So again, whole other talk, a whole other workshop, um, but happy to answer questions about it when I can. What you need to know about this is the encoding process is the initial learning, and we want people to be able to focus and use their energy wisely here. The second part to this is the storage. This is when we're practicing, okay? Specific networks are going to equal that knowledge or the behavior. So when we say storage, what we really mean is how, where, how much, and how long encoded information is retained in the memory system. So if you want to maintain something, as we know, I can pull out all the things you probably already heard. Use it or lose it, what wires together, fires together, um, and any other of those catchphrases that you might have heard before. But this is very critical. In the practice phase, this is when you want to use those metacognitive uh, uh, theories to embed into your design. Because this is when we can catch people going when they think they know something, but they don't know something. So this is when you want to embed those metacognitive theories so that we can get feedback and the learner can get feedback in real time. It's brilliant. This is also when you're designing, when you want to use things like spaced repetition, interleaving, testing effect. This is a great place for this. Remember, the goal is not to let someone get to the end of something and be like, I don't know what I'm doing. And then what do they do? What do we do? We go to Google, we go to YouTube videos, um, we go back to the e-learning and look for like two minutes and 30 seconds. And then we just waste a whole lot of time because we just never encoded the memory properly. Ah, blowing your minds, people. You guys doing okay over there? <laughs> Tom, oh, how, how's yeah, everyone the, doing? The chat's re really, really engaging with it. Um, I think there's some phrases coming out of it. Forgetting is a feature, not a bug. Uh, the <laughs> brain is expensive and the currency is energy. I feel like there are some quotes coming out of this that are going to probably hit social media in about 20 minutes, aren't they? <laughs> Good. Tell the world, people. Let's bring science into learning and the brain. Who, who knew? That's amazing. Um, so then our last, the last step of this obviously is the retrieval. So when you can do something with little effort or conscious thought, retrieval is the process through which you can literally access the stored information. Now, how you encode and store is also going to be important to this process, hence why we want to be intentional with it, right? And that's why the science of design, designing with science is, is, Oh, for any of my designers out there, if you ever want to really um, challenge yourselves and and every everything that I do now when it comes to design is, okay, pardon my language, but I'm going to say it, it's kind of a fuckery. Um, I love it. I love it to death because there's so much to take into consideration, but this is where we want to be incredibly intentional on how we do it. Tom, gonna gonna use your voice again and everybody Ooh. out there, let's have a little bit more fun, shall we? So. Let me ask you something. If you saw something um, 10 times, uh, no, if you saw something 100 times, could you remember it? Uh, I, would I would like to think so, yes. Right? Like, I think so. What about everyone in the chat there? If, you, if I showed you something like 100 times, could you remember it? We have yeses or noes coming. <laughs> Let's wait for that delay to clear. Mm. But, uh, Are we confident? Yeah. I, I would say reasonably. My wife would probably say no for me, but I, I feel like if I see something about a hundred times, I might I might remember it. Right. Okay. So in the chat, um, here's uh, for everybody. Here's what I'd like you to do. 
is you're going to see some numbered things in the next screen. Um, can you please in the chat tell me which one is, and you can't Google, and if, you, if there's too many of the right answer, I'm going to know that you cheated. So what number is the right Google? Because you, you've seen it like a million times, right? <laughs> And I can tell you, when I first did this with my colleague, we had no clue. <laughs> but who wants to take a, take a, some guesses out there in the chat? Which is the right Google? Well, this is a terrifying moment. I it? know, right? <laughs> Any numbers coming up there, Tom? Uh, none yet. I, I know I'm just looking at it and thinking, there's absolutely no chance that I know this. I would, yeah... Um... First number coming in is from Anna, and it's four. Lots of, in fact, there's lots of fours. Okay. There's a six, a one. Yeah. I think I might go five. Okay. A um, couple more. There you go. Trendsetter. That's me. A uh, couple more fives coming in. Um, we've got Jonathan Rock. Well, she did call it fuckery. Um, that's uh, <laughs> oh, like it. Yeah. A uh, couple oh, gosh, more six, a three, the most... a four. How many, sorry, how many people are, are, are with us right now? How many people uh, did just learn uh, that? <laughs> um, how many people just learned the term fuckery? <laughs> I think we're, sorry, I've not got that window open in front of me. Okay, well, let's just um, say at least one. Thanks, Jonathan. <laughs> so, it's okay. definitely more than one. Uh, <laughs> All Brilliant. right. I'm gonna I'm gonna say move us forward and say that for the most of you, you got Googled, Tom. You led the train. It was number five. Just so you guys can see it again. Yay. Number five. Number five is the correct Google. I remembered something. This is a good day. I'll go away now. <laughs> well, you might have remembered it, but what we actually see from this, like, and I can tell you, like, so even people who have done this who work at Google, they don't even recognize it themselves. Now, here's what we discover from this. From this, right, is this is the demonstration of what happens between. Repeated exposure, we've seen it a million times, versus deep processing. So it shows us that we can see something repeatedly, but without deep processing it, right? Without that recognition, the information fails to be encoded as a memory. So again, we can bring in a theory of metacognition to this as well. We need to help people identify what they know, what they think they know, and what they don't know. So some people would have looked at that and go, oh yeah, I can identify it. That's Google. Be like, oh, so you thought you knew that, but you actually didn't know that. Now, it's, this is, I just got off of, right before I came uh, to, to hang, out, hang out with all of you, I was in a meeting, we were talking about this, and I just quickly did this experiment um, with, the, with the client that I was on the phone with. And I was like, well, this is the equivalent of when, you know, a company does a new initiative, and they, you know, get all these posters, and they put them in the lunchroom, and they put them in the bathroom, and they put them in the hallways, thinking like, yeah, everyone's going to get it, no worries. But they don't. Repeated exposure does not mean deep processing. So remember that when you are designing learning, when you're trying to teach somebody something, we have to process it in a deeper, more meaningful way to get those networks to grow. So how do we do this? How do we become more intentional, right? We have to really get focused and be strategic about the way that we not only go about our own learning, but obviously those of us who are responsible for designing it for others as well. What I would like to do right now is we've gone about 34 minutes. I've exhausted your cognitive load already. I'm, I apologize. I've gone against the science itself. So I just want to take a quick pause. Um, I don't know if I've got any of my nature lovers out there. This is like my, like, this is my, this is my jam, people. Like, I can stare at this screen and I'm just going to invite you to either stare at it with me. Take a really nice deep breath. I'm here in Stockholm. It's going on, I don't know, 5.30 in the evening. Looking at this just for a moment and taking a quick pause. Believe it or not, 30 seconds, a lot of empirical evidence with science, and we know it helps us to downregulate and to refocus. Big breath in. Ah, big breath out. And I got one more little thing for you. Okay, Tom, I'm gonna to need your help on this one. In the chat, as fast as you can, here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to write uh, in the chat, I want you to type out as fast as you can, a tool, the name of a tool, a color, and a fruit. A tool, a color, and a fruit, go. And Tom will tell me what comes up in there. Okay, let's see what we get. Mm. Uh.
do. In the meantime, we had lots, lots of positive things being said. Lots of people getting a lot out of this. Yeah. Uh, okay, here we go. <laughs> we have got Hammer Blue Banana. Excellent. What else we got? Hammer Red Banana. Uh, <laughs> Hammer Green Apple. Uh, Hammer Pink Apple. Hammer Red Apple. Um, okay. Vice Red Apple. Vice Grip Red Apple. Hammer, Blue Apple. These are All disturbingly right. similar. It's almost like you've done something to this audience. <laughs> Wrench, Red Apple, Needle, okay, Teal, Banana. There I we go. We, we get the, you, I haven't exactly done something to you. Um, now, I did do a couple of things. Well, one thing. I did one thing incredibly intentional. Um, and some of you might have picked up on it. Maybe, or maybe you did, maybe you didn't. So priming, cueing, and triggering. At the very beginning, when I first started talking to you, I started priming your brains to be able to produce some of these <laughs> answers. That's number one. I told you that I was like really like I was horrible at like home renovations, which would have triggered the effect of the um, of the hammer. And I think I, I I probably would have said something about a red or an apple. So I did prime you. Now, beautiful design tip. We can use this in designs, and we can prime cues to trigger the brain later to help the brain make associations. And I can, there's a whole other, uh, older, you know, I, it, it's easy for me to just say these things, but actually implementing them into your designs does take, you need to learn how to do it. But I'm showing you that these things can be done. The second thing that this shows us is this, it's hard to go against our natural associations. When you've known something for, um, you know, one way for as long as you have, it can be very challenging to go against it. So like nobody said, um, I don't know, someone said vice grips. That's a, that's a new one for like, I would have like, what? But no one said like C-clamp or um, I don't know, like hacksaw. <laughs> so we have natural associations that we, that we go. So when differences are deemed uh, subtle to the brain, it consolidates what it already has and it moves on and it completely ignores the rest. So if we want to pay attention to something, we have to make it mildly unusual or we have to find a way um, to direct attention to it. Okay, so attention's not simple though. It really isn't. Um, and I actually wrote that on my next slide. Attention's not simple. Now, what you're seeing over here is we can use attentional networks in the brain to help focus. Now, what you're seeing on the right side of your screen, you can see alerting network, orienting network, executive network. I'm not going to go into all of this, but here's what I will tell you. People used to think that focus was like a spotlight. You could flash a, flight, uh, a flashlight on something, we could just focus on it. That's actually not the case. Um, in 2019, uh, a professor from MIT, a neuroscientist from MIT, he proved this theory wrong. We have multiple attentional networks in the brain, and they all do different things. So some of them do guide us through... Um, through alerting us through sounds or through visuals. And we can actually use these when you know uh, the science and, and you understand the operational system, I can actually use attentional networks to help my learners focus and design in helping them to focus. So what happens is, and I'll just give you like the high level when it comes to attentional networks and focus, it's not the flashlight. There's a very specific part of your brain that's dimming the switch on everything else and helping your brain focus on whatever particular thing it is that you want someone to focus on. So not a flashlight, it's a dimmer switch to everything else around it. Again, hours of lectures and, and more things and learning how to design with this stuff. Um, you know, I'm six years in and I'm still wowed and heh, the fuckery of, <laughs> of how to do all of this. When it comes to us as, as L&D professionals, this is usually our problem sometimes, is how do you get people to look at something differently when it looks the same? We see initiatives that look the same, we see processes that looks the same. So if I showed you this picture, these, this two-sided screen, I said, listen, there's four things different between these two Mona Lisas. What are they? And you can just like look at it for a moment and just like hang out with that for a second. So can you see them? Now, over time, the brain will learn to distinguish what is different and we can help it though, right? So we can intentionally design to help it. So using the attentional networks or just doing something really simple by exaggerating distinctiveness, we can exaggerate uniqueness. So I'll show you now where the four were. Can you imagine, can you, it's really that simple people. Sometimes all we need to do is draw a big X on it or a big circle and be like, look here. And all of a sudden, the network in your brain that is governing the visual system is going, oh, right, okay, now I see it. And all I had to do was 
address that in that way. So we basically need to master details in a focused mode of thinking and then comprehend how everything fits together in a diffused mode. So you might have heard of these two modes before is Barbara Oakley's work. So diffusion, um, there's a focus mode of learning and thinking, and then there's the diffusion mode. In the focus mode, when we go back to our memory systems, that's when we're doing the encoding and the practicing. But then we, we need time to diffuse. Why does learning take time? Because memory consolidates while we're sleeping. Part of the consolidation process of memory is happening while we are sleeping, which is why spaced repetition, interleaving, all of those methodologies you can't just throw them in anywhere whenever you want to. They have to be very intentionally and strategically designed in. There are time variables that we need to take into consideration. Again, whole other lesson. <laughs> so, but sometimes you can do something as simple as just draw a circle around it. So as my time is coming to an end with you, I just want to remind you that you have learned absolutely nothing. <laughs> But I want to thank you guys for, for just hanging out with me, for letting me mess with you a little bit. Um, and just remember this, we are in an industry and we are in a time in history right now where we really have, um, we have an opportunity to change things. So I'll leave you with this, which is science needs your help, learning needs your help, and I need your help. I'm advocating hard on behalf of science, on the behalf of the scientists, and in our industry to really evolve the way that we do things. And you participating in this today and showing your interest and seeing the value is one massive step towards that. So I will leave it at that. I am gonna stop sharing my screen so I can see faces and chats and all the things. And I'll of course leave you with a yar because <laughs> whatever you're up to, I know you are really ready. Wow, that was awesome thank you so much i know the chat's got loads going on there oh uh, no i can kind of see you guys oh, i can't see the chat but let me see Ooh. let's go over here there we go the, there we go um yeah so lo loads loads going on there um if you if anyone's got any questions, now's the time. Uh, we have a we have a little bit of time before we need to go to the next session. So uh, get them in now. I mean, um, obviously, say so you're um, sort of on the on a bit of a crusade, shall we say, to, oh. to bring science into learning. So yeah. I think that the one question I'd want to ask if if I want more of this, where do I go? Where can I get more? Okay, first of all, um, get in touch with me. That's really important. Actually, I'm really happy that you asked that. Um, I okay. I'll just share a secret with 66 of you um, because the only way you <laughs> the only way you get help is if you ask for it. So I'm going to ask for it. Um, myself and my board of advisors for the past three years, I have been working on the new series, which will teach you um, about your operational system itself. So what we just did in this last 45 minutes is like you know scratch of the surface what I've been designing for three years with the team, um, and we're now getting to the point of almost being able to produce is the series called Joining Forces with Your Brain, which will teach you all about the operational system, more effective ways to learn. And then obviously for my learning designers out there who wanna take that a step further, um, that will come later on. We are looking for expressions of interest in the form of a letter that says, if you want these things, if you want to learn these things, if you want to bring these to your organizations, we need to know who are you, where do you work, how many people are there, and if this was available, would you want it? And with those expressions of interest, we're going to go out and we are going to get the funding we need to make this symphony of learning come to life. And that's how you guys can help. Awesome. I would. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I think you can count on some of those based on the responses here. And we've got questions flooding in as well. And if you're um, in London, I got to say, if you're in London and you're going to be at the LPI Awards next week, um, I just told Tom secret, I am going to be making an appearance later on. The pirate is going to show her face at the LPI Awards. So please come say hi if you're there. So um, first question we've got there. Uh, what is priming? Ooh, Chital, great question. Priming is when we can use an image or a sound to uh, to put something in the brain, sort of like little working memory so that we can activate it later. So when I primed you at the very beginning by saying, I don't like if your home renovations, I was priming your brain. I was dipping into the network that goes renovations. What do you use to renovate? Tools. What are tools? Hammers. I was already priming. So we can use priming and or we can call them cues. So you can reactivate those as you're going. So I could have said, you know, I, I could have explicitly said hammer, 
like, oh, never give me a hammer. And then later on, when I asked you to say a tool, the scaffold, the natural scaffold um, in, your, in your brain, and it's called a schema, it's the way that things are sort of organized in there, it would have activated that. And you can do that with your learning and, and you can embed that into learning design. Brilliant. So it's a primer and then a trigger. Just remember, it's a primer, but then it has to be triggered by something later. Fantastic. Great question. Um, next one we've got um what percentage of what you talked about today is true about neurodiverse people i love that you brought that up so neuro okay so i was literally just having conversations with my board about this there is a ton of different when we say neurodiverse we have to remember there's different types of of neurodiversity in the world if you could be adhd you could have a cognitive uh, uh degenerative disorders you could be someone who suffered from a stroke so what ha is true about neurodiverse people? What I've talked about here can apply to a, a brain that is, uh, I would say, not necessarily in the degenerative states. Uh, Saidi, oh, I'm pronouncing your name wrong. I know I'm pronouncing your name wrong, and I'm sorry. Um, we are trying to address how do we look at the operational system, because when we're looking at neurodiversity, it could be a deficit in any part of the brain. So we wouldn't necessarily be able to imply all of these things, but we can use a lot of these techniques when it comes to learning but we are trying to address this thank you so 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 much for bringing that up it's something that we're trying to figure out how do we address this in the industry so i appreciate you bringing it up nope not all the brains are the same we definitely don't have all the same brains we have all the same pieces but as you saw they definitely aren't wired together they're, they're, we're not wired the same way awesome uh from jonathan how do we maximize the diffusion mode in our Ooh, facilitation jonathan time you have to give people time. Now, that could be in, you know, during breaks, even when you give people breaks, they're going into the diffusion mode. And when, when we're designing, you can do that in very short time increments as well. So if I'm doing like an hour to two hour long session, most people will time and do like a 10 to 15 minute break, whereas I'll do shorter breaks in between. So I'll be like, all right, let's take a two minute here. Let's take a three minute here. Let's take a one minute here which allows for a little bit more diffusion time. So I would say instead of like going for the hard, like hard 15 minute, 10, 15 minute break when you're designing, go for the shorter amount, the shorter ones. Good stuff. Cool. Um, I'm going to say uh, we've got two more questions. I, okay. I'm going to have to say no more um, because we're going to run into the next session otherwise. Sorry, um, guys. But uh, so on here, uh, where could we see examples of designs that are changed before and after, sort of before and after examples of when this sort of thing is applied? Do you know you anywhere would have where they to come, uh, Well, no, because they are clients' designs, so no. Um, but I, what I could do, um, Cindy, in in other presentations that I've done, I've actually sort of uh, opened the wizard's cur curtain at the end, and I've shown people how it was done. So, um, Cindy, if you want to get in touch, I can help you to sort of like see a little bit behind the curtain. Brilliant. And the last one, and this is quite a quite a big question. Whoa. Um, <laughs> so um, what, what I might do is let you read it, uh, rather than me read it out, because it's annoying for long, long periods of me talking. That is a very, very deep rooted question. Um, I'm not, honestly, I'm not even gonna touch that one right now because it, it now we're going into, we're not only going into linguistics and we're not even, you know, depending on the, the language itself, but we're also going into environments. We're going into social factors. We're going into environmental factors, how someone was brought up, how memories were encoded. Um, it is, it's an incredibly valid question, incredibly and very intelligent question. Thank you for asking that. Um, if you want to connect with me and you want to just jam out on that and talk about that, I'm going to say this isn't my area of expertise and I will never speak to something that's not. Same with the neurodiversity. It's not my area of expertise. But um, these are incredibly valid questions that you're asking. And I'd be happy to talk those out or at least give you the resources to some of my nerds who could help you with that. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much 
Um, I think this has been like, everyone's loved this session. We can see it in oh, the chat. Thanks, guys. I know. I <laughs> I'm just a nerd um, helping people learn. <laughs> <laughs> that's what we need. We need, to, we need more of exactly that. So, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for joining us again. Uh, we've got a, a slightly short break now. I think we've got about 10 minutes until our next session, uh, where we will be joined by, if I have my list in front of me, uh, Danielle talking about learning personas. Yay, Danielle. So, we shall see you all shortly. <laughs>